Hello, this is Louise Jameson, and you're listening to The Sirens of Audio. You know, travel does broaden the mind. So welcome to the special edition of the Sirens of Audio. Today is the 8th of March. And the 8th of March is a significant day as it's International Women's Day. So we thought it'd be good just to do a little celebration of women and our thankfulness for them in terms of what's been happening with Big Finish. And so our special guest for today is Helen Goldwyn. Helen, welcome. Thank you, lovely to be here. Thank you for asking. Now it's really great to have you on board because um, you are a producer, a writer, an actor, uh, director of Big Finish Productions, what's it like to wear so many hats? It's actually perfect for me. Um, I think I went through a lot of my career feeling very frustrated when I was being perceived as the thing that I was doing in that moment. So, you know, obviously I was working in musicals and theatre theater shows and um, when you're in a musical, people assume you're a singer and a dancer and then they probably doubt that you can do serious acting and then when you're acting in something they're shocked that you can sing and dance and I think I've been fighting my whole career to be perceived as many things you know I love the term polymath you know I do think uh, that sums up who I am and what I always wanted to be uh, and Big Finish is probably the only company that has ever recognized the many facets of, of who I am so it's wonderful. Now you entered Big Finish as an actor originally, and we are, we are going to talk to you soon, uh, more at length about some of your other um, things you've done. Uh, today we just mm -hmm. want to focus more on International Women's Day. Um, sure. How, how did you make the transition between, or how did you start, because you started as an actor, how, what was the next transition mm. that Big Finish helped you do? Well, I had been directing my own writing in Fringe Theatre, so I had quite a few directing credits on my CV. Um, but actually, the thing that prompted me to go to Big Finish and ask to be something different, you know, to ask if they would consider me as a director was because of really the 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 end of a, of a creative project that I had been very immersed in. Because that had been so thoroughly smashed and broken, I thought, well, I'll just try something completely different. So I took my courage in my hands and emailed Nicholas Briggs thinking, oh, this could be awful because if they, they don't want me as a director, then they might be too embarrassed to ask me back as an actor because they'll feel awkward about that. <laughs> so I wrote this email and, uh, and then Nick wrote back straight away and said, oh, what a great idea. Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> so, yes, yeah, something that was a tentative little kind of tentacle um, into, the, into that world of directing just triggered a whole new phase of my career. So in terms of directors at Big Finish, there's you, I think, Lisa Bowerman and Louise yes. Jameson. Is it just the three That's of you at right. the moment, women directors? Yes, I believe so, which is strange, isn't it? I don't know why it should be that way. Um, maybe other women aren't interested, but I'm sure they would be. Um, but I do know that Big Finish is uh, taking on a, innumerable new um, female writers. I mean, they're really working hard to diversify that, that writing pool um, in terms of um, heritage as well. You know, obviously we're trying to be as inclusive uh, as possible. Uh, but I suppose lots of people are busy doing writing elsewhere or they think it's not their thing. I suppose the science fiction element of it might be a factor as maybe it's more unusual for women to want to direct science fiction, but I, I can't speak for anyone else. I know I love it. In terms of the whole industry out there, are there, what's the proportion of women to men are there directing either theatre, television, um, what's those sort of proportions like? Do I think? don't know um, any of those sort of uh, statistics, really. But I suppose we have to work on the assumption that although things are getting better, it's still swayed very much towards more men than women. I don't think we're equal yet. 
um, but but there have been great strides forward in recent times, and um, I think that uh, I think we will get there. But yeah, I think it is still male dominated. Yeah. Um, so your writing did, did all your writing start because of writing your own shows and doing your own songs? Is that how your writing began? Well, again, as it has happened many, many times in my life. When things go horribly wrong, I try and use that as a, a platform for creating something great, you know, making something happen. Because I, I was so thwarted in my career as an actor, I just couldn't get auditions for anything. I think people assume when you're an actor, you get rejected a lot from auditions. But I could not get through the door for many of the things that I wanted because I didn't fit into an archetype. I wasn't a physical, you know, I wasn't physically obviously anything um in terms of the normal casting types i was i could be many things and and people don't want that in an oversaturated industry they want someone who instantly is the is the part so i would get discarded before the auditions even happened um so i crashed an audition for fiddler on the roof i sat in the corridor for six hours and said you must see me uh, it was the last time that topol was going to be um playing the lead in that if you can hear that bell that's my cat <laughs> i'm gonna bell on my dog I've, I've locked my yeah. dog out <laughs> that's the exact same bell that philip's dog's got my dog I thought it was his bell. dog <laughs> <laughs> She's just come in to see me and then she'll be disinterested and leave. Um, so I auditioned for Fiddler on the Roof. They did see me and then they offered me understudy to one of the daughters, um, which was not what I wanted. I'd done a lot of understudying then. I had thought this is my part. This is for me. And then they still offered me understudy. So much to my agent's dismay, I turned it down. It was a year's work going on international tour. I just couldn't take it. I couldn't accept that that role. Um, and then I had to justify that decision. So that was when I wrote my first script. I wrote a screenplay and I entered it for a Channel 4 competition. And that was that was the start of it, really. Excellent. So today is being released by Big Finish the 8th of March. Now, the first 8th of March, this is actually 8th of March, Volume 2. It uh, is. The first one you directed two years ago, when 2020 yes. came out, the 8th of March. Mm -hmm. uh, can you tell us how the 8th of March project started? Well, I believe, I mean, they might tell me this is not correct, but I believe it stems from an initiative that we had with Attergirl, uh, which, as you've mentioned, I think is one of the series in the originals um, series that I uh, produced and co-wrote. So Attergirl was very female uh, oriented and it was a female team. And then Louise Jameson said, well, why don't we release it on um, International Women's Day and to be perfectly honest I had never heard of International Women's Day <laughs> so um, you know we, we looked it up and found out all about it thought yeah great it's a celebration of female power and and um, courage let's do that so we all became aware at Big Finish of International Women's Day and then David Richardson I think seized upon that idea and thought let's really make this a time where we celebrate the women of, of the worlds of Doctor Who uh, in the same way that we did with Attergirl. So that's what I think initiated it for the first series. Coming soon, a Big Finish original drama, Attergirl. I'm so sorry, excuse me. Is this the air transport auxiliary? New recruit? Yes. Welcome to White Water. The menace is the woman who thinks that she ought to be flying in a high-speed bomber when she really has not the intelligence to scrub the floor of a hospital properly. Why have you framed that quote? Because I like to remind myself what we're up against. We are a small group of women pilots with a job to do. The Spitfire is very special. You just need to touch her with your little finger and she will dance with you. Come, Come in, in low. low. Cut the engine over the boundary head. Cut the engine Cut over the, the boundary edge. And float down on all three points. Float down on all three points. David. Can I ask you something first? Yes, Daphne. Will you? Will you kiss me? Amelia. Do you know what my three favourite words in the English language are? Uh, more champagne, please? Not <laughs> too bad, but no. Cold front clearance. My number one tip is not to forget your Bibles. <laughs> How will a Bible help us fly a plane? Uh, what did I say? Oh, these 
these guys are crazy. <laughs> we should get Jackie. Sweetie, <laughs> dying. Oh, adorable. <laughs> you laughing at me? She didn't mean a religious Bible. She meant the very pilot's notes, and we call it the Bible. You'll each be issued one. Never go anywhere without it. It tells you everything you might need to know about flying whatever plane you find yourself in. We may be on the path to equality for women in aviation, but we still have to take ten paces for every five that a man takes. Have you flown before? Big finish. We love stories. I hadn't realised Atta Girl 1 was released on International mm. That's spectacular. That's excellent. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we have actually promoted Atta Girl a lot. <laughs> yes, yeah, thank you. We think it's amazing. Oh, um, thank you. Um, We're really I, um, proud of it. It's the thing I'm most proud of, really. It's the, the thing I've I've written and had a hand in kind of overseeing. Uh, yeah, I, I'm super, super proud of both series. Yeah, and number, of course, season two, which was released last year on March 8th, the National Women's Day, was nominated yes. for an Audi. Was it was, right? yes. Yes, and At A Girl 1 was, was a finalist in the BBC Audio Drama Awards as well. So it was both of them ha- were finalists, um, respectively. So, yes, the Audis are uh, the Audio Publishers Association Awards in New York. So that was quite a big deal. Um, but we didn't win. <laughs> but it was no, but, wonderful but to get, get to the, the finals. We hundreds and hundreds of pieces of audio that are released each year. And they narrowed it down yeah. to, I think, five. Yeah. Um, so to be in the top five of everything released in that year is an amazing achievement. And if people who haven't listened to At A Girl, I can't encourage you more in terms of <laughs> um, strong emotional stories, suspense. Um, it, yeah, every story is unique. The, f- the first series follows a series of um, women, but each story episode kind of told to a different woman's eyes, which is just mm. powerful and it grows together. Um, number two has a, a big, bit of a time difference in it, but the power between that story too and some of the things that happen... Um, yeah, it, it is devastating what happens to some of the women, but also important stories to tell. Yes, that's yeah. That's how, how I describe it. Yes, and a, and a moment in history that, again, not many people um, knew about um, or know about. I do think, I think there's a TV series that was optioned, I think just before COVID. Again, there's a production company that was working on it. And Louise and I certainly spoke to... Um, a couple of production companies because there was interest in making it uh, a TV series. But of course it would be uh, possibly prohibitively expensive because you have to have the aircraft uh, and it has to be historically accurate. It would have to involve so many planes. I'm not sure how, how viable that would be. Yeah, actually, we should just say what are what are who are the Atta girls? We haven't actually described them at all. The Air Transport Auxiliary Women. So there were, I think, about 162. I might have got that number slightly wrong. Um, who were they? Had been civilian uh, pilots. Some of them. Some of them had trained from scratch. But they were all these incredible, eccentric, courageous women who were ferrying the aircraft to the RAF. So they were ferrying the the craft across uh, the country, obviously with no weaponry on board and obviously potential targets themselves um, in attacks. And uh, yeah, I mean, the things they did, if you read up about the the real life air transport auxiliary women, you'll be mind boggled by how incredible they were. And all of them were exceptional. It's not the kind of job you would do unless you were exceptional. And and like lots of stories, for decades, all our war stories revolved men fighting on the fronts, fighting in particular mm-hmm. places, and yet so much of what's actually going on is actually being held together by women. Yes, um, in various, yes. Not, and you know, some of the, some of the women are on the front line too and doing amazing things as well. But those stories mm-hmm. just haven't been told, and it's only really in the last decade or so that stories of women by women are becoming more and more told. Yes, it's weird, isn't it? Because we've got so much to say. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, as I say, things are definitely improving and it, it doesn't feel like we're the underdogs anymore. It feels like it's an advantage to be a woman um, these days. Or even for someone like me, I'm 50, nearly 51, and uh, my age and my gender has never been an obstacle 
to doing what I want to do. So I feel very fortunate to be living in an era when that that is all possible. Yeah, it's possible in an industry where often, certainly in the past, age has been a major factor mm. in terms of you know when you hit a certain age, you don't you know you don't have the perceived look that people yeah. wanted more. Um, and then you know there's no roles often for women until they, they hit the sixties again <laughs> or beyond. Yes. Um, well, I suppose that's one of the advantages to me in that I came out of the the conventional acting industry, um, and obviously continued to work in voice. Um, and continue to do my own sort of one woman musical shows, but I wasn't beholden to what the industry wanted a, as a physical aesthetic. Um, and, and my age and my experience now is hugely advantageous to me. So if anything, my career is going from strength to strength. Nothing is stalling um, because I'm over 50. It, people are looking at me and saying, wow, look at all that um, experience you've got. We, we want to use some of that. So I feel in, in a very, very privileged position in that respect. Well, Anna Girls is a show written by women, um, starring women, produced and directed <laughs> by women, um, but yes. also being released and being released today is um, the 8th of, Mar- 8th, of, 8th of March, which is book, um, the second version. There's one two years ago as well. From Big Finish Productions, the 8th of March, Protectors of Time. Built by my people. Unknown, Master Birok. K9! K9! Where are you? I believe I may have overestimated our survival time. Ah! I think I'm in between dimensions and the service ducts of a pan-dimensional tesseract on the edge of collapse. What are they? Keep up, Flick. They're clearly robots. Doctor? Um, pardon? It's you. The man I kissed on another planet. Okay, that's too much information about my dad. Ugh, don't let them get close. Ugh, they grip like iron. Ugh. Is this what you do? Save the world? Ow! <laughs> Rather a lot lately. But my main occupation is liberating beautiful things from unappreciative owners. Hence my interest in the diamond. Everyone out! This way! Oh, did you have a plan? <clears throat> Not usually. Right now, it's kick all the robots until they stop. Oh. We won't get much further. Our trajectory is bringing us down near the base. Brakes for impact. <gasps> We're crashing. It, it's all right. No, no worry. You know, think of this as all part of the fun. And, and well, just hold on tight, that's all. Enough. Guards, secure the prisoners. They will witness the final phase. Rio, stop! No! No, Rio, don't go down there! The new family. The new time. The new time. The new the Prism is patented tech, owned wholly by the Fifth Index, its subsidiaries and its private stockholders. The Fifth Index asserts its exclusive right to use of the Prism, its planetary franchises, and any and all planetary trademarks, logos, and brands. This is starting to make a bizarre kind of sense. Is it, though? Now, you've directed yes. both of these as well. So how did mm-hmm. these, from real-life stories, real-life women, we then went to taking the, the strong <laughs> Doctor Who women and yes. combining them together in terms of giving them their own stories? Um, yeah. What must be the process of picking those stories and, and coming together? Because you've directed these. What else has been part well, of Well, I direct them. I, I do not um, – I'm not involved in – the creation of them and that's the role of the producer and the executive producer so on this occasion for series two the producer is emma haig um who's wonderful to work with uh and actually quite a sort of reserved person but she's overseen the creation of these extravagant hugely fantastical um stories they're so fresh and different to to what we do with some of the other series they're they're just so quirky and they swerve into different realms and different concepts and uh, every time I read an eighth of March March script I think oh wow okay (laughs) they're doing that now it's so um fun and light and frothy and imaginative I noticed uh, that Louise Jameson has a, a director's credit as well is that right yeah, this year it was split between us. I've directed two of them and Louise has directed one of them. And 
I mean, I think that was down to availability and scheduling, but also that Big Finish knows that we collaborate uh, all the time and, and there's absolutely no, <laughs> there's no issue with, with uh, splitting it in that way. Um, so, yeah, I don't even know what Louise's episode is. I don't know what that story is. So when I get the box set in the, in the post, I shall be listening with fresh ears like everybody else to that one. So what are your two stories? <laughs> so we've got one that is starring um, Jenny, the Doctor's daughter, and Lady Christina. So they're a fantastic combo. So it's Prism um, by Abigail Burdess. That's correct, yes. And that is one that takes us all over, you know, all over the place, up into space, back down on Earth, a Lady Christina's bus. Um, and th- there's a great kind of uh, meeting between dimensions in a way between Jenny and Christina and then they end up working together to to save the world (laughs) but it's also uh, got a a great allegory about um, social media and the way in which we are consumed by social media and how we we waste our lives and lose ourselves in it Um, there's a really great underlying theme there about how we need to get our faces up out of it and, and look at the real world around us. And the other story? So then we have Katie Manning, of course, uh, reprising her um, her role uh, as, oh my goodness, remind me. Joe Jones. Joe, of course. I always think of her as um, Iris. Iris. Wild time, yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's wild time. Um, yeah, so she's Joe Jones. And we've, of course, got the return of Anjali Mahindra in her character from the Sarah Jane adventures. Um And we've got Jay Griffiths returning as um, a character that we've seen before called Jack, who who works for UNIT. And yeah, this is another one that spans from the jungles of the Amazon up to space, up to the moon and back. And and this is about the environment and about how we preserve the ecology of the earth and how um, other alien species could quite feasibly be looking at what we're doing to this planet and disapproving and wanting to intervene um with good reason but at uh, the end of the day we've got to be left to to deal with it ourselves because you know it's something we're going to have to do uh so yes that was a fantastic dynamic working with katie as always she's got the most incredible energy and um jay as well it was the first time i worked with jay griffiths and she's hysterically funny both off mic and in this role as uh, jack um, and Anjali, of course, coming back to her role and uh, and just stepping straight back into it. And uh, yeah, it was all when we had two other very strong female characters in it as well. So, yeah, a really, really fun experience recording with all those amazing women. Anjali Mahindra has done many big finish uh, appearances over the over the last few years in particular. But I think yeah. this is the first time she's come back as Rani, isn't it? From the Sarah Jane uh, yes. Adventures. Yes. And I actually didn't realise that that was the case. I assumed she had played it before. And then I saw the response when it was announced online and with everybody saying, oh, this is the first time she's played Rani. And uh, I thought, oh, that's cool. Nobody told me. <laughs> I think Russell T. Davis, out of respect for Elizabeth Sladen and the whole Sarah Jane Adventures, wanted all the characters at least rested for a while. Um, yes, and then I think about a year or so ago during lockdown, they actually made a. He wrote a farewell to Sarah Jane, and all the characters sort of appeared at her wake, um, giving little speeches about Sarah Jane. And so I think that sort of allowed all the characters to come back to the page again, and he's obviously allowed Rani to reappear. Um, yes, we're hoping yeah. it's the first of many appearances because those Sarah Jane oh. kids are well loved and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good to see where Who knows? Yeah, how how were they touched by Sarah? <laughs> Indeed, yes, yes. They're carrying on the good work, aren't they? Yeah. What do you think is, I mean, your description of both those two stories in terms of the women writers, what do you think it is that women bring to science fiction, to Doctor Who, which is different from what men bring? Oh, that's an interesting question. I think it, it is a, maybe more of a focus on the emotional uh, complexity of women. Uh, obviously, men, male writers write about the emotional journey. There is no drama without an emotional journey. But um, I think we add a dimension to female characters 
perhaps, in the same way that, you know, of course, I can write male character dialogue and male character journeys, but I, I imagine a male writer will have a different perspective on the male psyche. And I'm sure it's the same for, for women and their female characters. Um, and I suppose we like to push our female characters in, in ways perhaps that uh, might not occur to, to other people. We want to give them push them beyond the bounds of the of what they are perceived to be yeah. because that's what we're trying to do as women every day anyway what do you know about the writers uh abigail burdess and uh nina milnes because i don't recognize those names can you tell us anything well, about them i they're both new to big finish yeah. um both experienced writers but that is all I know. I mean, the problem with us doing everything remotely is that we don't get to meet the writers anymore. Uh, sometimes they listen online if, if we're doing it remotely. But what used to happen is we would go to the studio and then the writer would come and spend the day in the engineering room with the director um, and that you would get to know them and, and understand uh, more about them. But they're just names on a, on a page in the same way to me as they are for everybody else because of the times that we're living in at the moment. But I hope I do get to meet them because they've both come up with extraordinary scripts. <laughs> yeah, really looking forward to hearing them. Every, every new writer uh, we mm. enjoy, and, and Liz, Elizabeth Miles, who's the other story, who as said Louise directed her. Um, and yes. Actually, look, looking at the fact the other one's a Lala Ward story, and Louise and Lala, of course, are good friends yeah. i'm not surprised they handed that to louise yes yeah um, yeah um, lala's fantastic yeah i love working with her she really is we've certainly been very i mean we've talked to a lot of the female writers the women writers on the show which we which is one of the things that we really appreciate um mm. but i one of the things that has struck me is in terms of sometimes women writers push things far further than male writers would but also the, the mm -hmm. fact that often women will push the bloodthirstiness and the murder and even depths of evil i mean i guess you know all the great UK writers like Agatha Christie and Dorothy Osseis and are women who just tend to have a a sense of, I guess, a sense of a human condition, but therefore they push it in terms of the evil of human condition sometimes too. Mm. And so I think we do see a different, yeah, a different, a different side of characters. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a great privilege. We're looking forward to hearing your latest release and we're looking forward to talking to you again soon as well. So Brilliant. thank you for joining us on the 8th of March. Thank you for having me. Lovely to see you. And happy International Women's Day. And to you. <laughs> this has been the Sirens of Audio, episode 98, the 8th of March, celebrating International Women's Day 2022, with our guest Helen Goldwyn and your hosts Philip Edney and Dwayne Bunny. Theme music by the Jackpot Golden Boys. Contact details, links to our podcast and video locations, social media, and more can be found at sirensofaudio.com Drop us some audio feedback via our message centre at anchor.fm slash sirensofaudio and tell us what you've enjoyed about your most recent audio drama journey. Because audio drama... Rawr!